Welcome to I-24 News Defense Magazine. I'm Alon Ben David with your weekly review of security, intelligence, and strategic affairs. In this edition, is the threat of chemical weapons changing? Will internal tensions in Gaza spilling over to Israel ignite the region once again this summer? And hundreds of defense and security companies attended an expo in Tel Aviv despite boycott threats. Let's begin. The use of chemical weapons, particularly against civilian populations, has been a major concern in the war zones of the Middle East. Recent reports suggest that the IS terrorist group is using chemicals to attack and is recruiting trained professionals to produce such weapons. Lorraine Eiso reports. On August 21, 2013, at 2.30 a.m., the residents of a suburb outside of Damascus, Syria, were awoken by a series of explosions. More than 1,500 people, including hundreds of children, were killed, and it wasn't long before investigators concluded that this had not been an ordinary attack. One of the first images that emerged from Ghouta is a video showing a room full of children dead, many of them in their pajamas without a single injury on their bodies. And immediately we knew that this was a crime of a completely different magnitude. The United Nations determined that a large number of casualties was a result of the use of a chemical weapon, a colorless, odorless nerve agent called sarin. The international community, most vocally the United States, condemned the attack and urged that those responsible for it be held accountable. President Obama believes there must be accountability for those who would use the world's most heinous weapons against the world's most vulnerable people. While evidence suggested that the Syrian army had carried out the attack, Syrian President Bashar Assad has denied time and again that forces loyal to his government had anything to do with the worst attack in Syria's bloody four-year-long civil war. The Syrian government, however, agreed to a deal brokered by the United States and Russia to eliminate its chemical weapons arsenal, forestalling potential U.S. airstrikes, and agreed to join the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons as part of the agreement. In mid-April of this year, Human Rights Watch released a report suggesting that new forms of chemical weapons are still in use. It is true that we've seen reports about the use of chlorine in bombs that have the effect of chemical weapons. This council and the international community more broadly needs to do more to protect civilians and ensure greater accountability for violations of international humanitarian law. There have also been recent reports of the use of chlorine gas by the Islamic State against Kurdish Peshmerga fighters in Iraq. Using chemicals as a weapon has been described by the international community as inhumane and an atrocious act of war. Their presence in the Middle East could be detrimental to an already deteriorating region. And we are joined now by Hamish de Breton Gordon, Managing Director of Avon, Chemical, Biological, Radiological and Nuclear Protection Company, a leading expert who came to Israel for the 2015 International Defense and Homeland Security Export. Mr. de Breton Gordon, thank you for joining us. Pleasure. You have seen and reviewed the use of uh, chemical weapons in the variety of uh, battlefield in the last three decades. What is unique about the recent Syrian combat zone? Well, you're right. I've been involved in um, terrorism for the last 27 years in the chemical and biological field uh, in Iraq, Afghanistan and all over the world. And in the last four years in Syria and Iraq, I think one of the uh, most striking things that I've found, particularly working in Syria uh, with doctors, is the huge psychological impact that the use of um, sarin, the nerve agent, by the Assad regime in August 2013, and more recently his use of chlorine, which is just a, a toxic chemical, has had on the population. Um, and although they're not as poisonous or toxic as nerve agents like sarin and VX, it's had the psychological impact to terrify civilian populations in Syria and in Iraq. How did those weapons become so common in the Syrian and also in the Iraqi regions? Well, I think, first of all, it's well documented that Assad had a very extensive chemical weapons arsenal. Now, although the international community and the UN removed 90% of these chemical weapons in 2013 and 2014, it is very likely that he still has some left. Also, the use of chlorine and cyanide is a chemicals which are very readily available in Syria and Iraq. It's very difficult 
to legislate for chlorine and cyanide, both these chemicals have many commercial uses in water purification uh, and other decontamination. Do you think the world is doing enough to stop the horror or what else can be done? A lot of innocent civilians ask me why the international community is not doing more. Um, I think it's been, you know, they've been following some wrong paths. They've been equating Syria to Iraq and Afghanistan and they're very different problems. I think in the first instance, I'm very keen that the UN and the international community should instigate a no-fly zone, particularly in northwest Syria. This would prevent barrel bombs being used against civilians and would also allow aid to get in. Um, I think it's also very important that people in Syria and Iraq continue to collect evidence so that at some stage the perpetrators of these atrocities will face the International Criminal Court like Bosnian and Kosovan generals are today. So what are the lessons that can be learned from Syria and Iraq for Israel and for the rest of the Middle East? Yes, I think there are some lessons that uh, Israel can learn from what is happening in Syria and Iraq at the moment. Um, the widespread use of improvised uh, chemical weapons uh, and potentially improvised radiological weapons by Islamic State and by Assad um, is something that, that is fairly new on the battlefield and we need to protect against it. Um, however, there are some very simple and basic uh, procedures that can be put in place to provide uh, resilience. I think it is recognizing that terrorists are actually using these type of weapons now, which is the key thing, rather than perhaps burying one's head in the sand. Mr. De Burton Gordon, thank you very much. The 2015 International Defense and Homeland Security Expo was held in Tel Aviv last week. Despite many participants and presentations, politics and boycott threats took center stage. Lauren Izo has more. Over 20 international delegations and 250 Israeli and foreign companies presented in the 7th International Exhibition of Defense and Homeland Security in Tel Aviv. This year, the exhibition focused on lessons from Operation Protective Edge, the recent round of fire between Israel and Hamas, and on the global war on terror. Some European firms reportedly withdrew from presenting in the expo due to the limitations on certain weapon exports to Israel put in place following the operation, in what may appear to be part of a European an effort to boycott Israel. The French ambassador to Israel denied these allegations. French companies do not need authorization from the French government to come to this expo. I tell you unequivocally that there is no boycott. So companies, if they are here or not here, is their most absolute decision. The Israeli organizers, while open about their certain restrictions, avoid using the term boycott. There's a distinction between attack and defense products. With France, Belgium, England and Germany, it's easier to work on protective products. We can see here a number of protection companies from these countries. But when it's weaponary products, especially arms and ammunition, it becomes impossible with European countries. The Ukrainian delegation was the only former Soviet Union country to have made the trip. Russia declined to participate. In May, the Kremlin strongly discouraged Israeli military assistance to Ukraine. I know Russia was telling many countries, not Israel only, not to help Ukraine, but I believe that's the decision of a particular nation, how to behave, how to put themselves in the international stance, and how to find friends. If we can get back to normal business, when Russia will become back, to get back to the census, and will understand that this 21st century, we are too going to, to, to cooperate rather than to fight with each other. Then the cooperation will flourish. Between Israel and Russia and Ukraine, everything will be much, much better than now. From the large Czech Republic delegation to the more modest Japanese one, all agreed that security and military relations with Israel are as good as ever. Hamas's relationship with Salafi jihadi groups operating in Gaza has led to a series of clashes between Hamas and self-proclaimed ISIS affiliates operating in the Strip. With several rockets fired at Israel, these tensions trickle to Israel who so far responded moderately. Will the growing tension develop into another summer of fire? Before we discuss these questions further, a quick reminder of recent events. Peace and quiet continue to elude those living on both sides of the Israel-Gaza border as violence has erupted once again. Rockets were fired into southern Israel, setting off sirens in the city of Ashkelon, the town of Netivot, and other locations. The rockets landed in open areas, causing no casualties and no damage. 
Israeli warplanes responded with airstrikes in the Gaza Strip. The Israeli military said targets including militant training camps, while Palestinian sources claimed sites belonging to the military wing of Hamas were struck. While Hamas may have been the target of the strikes, a different group, calling itself the Sheikh Omar Hadid Brigade, claimed responsibility for the rocket attacks. It said it was payback for the killing of an Islamic State militant a day before by Hamas. Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Yalon released a statement saying Hamas was responsible for anything that happens in the Gaza Strip, even if those shooting were in fact rebelling against the militant organization. For its part, the group said on Twitter it would continue its jihad against the Jews and would not be deterred. And joining me now in the studio is Avi Sakharov, uh, Times of Israel's and Wara News Middle East analyst. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Alon. When we look at ISIS present in the Gaza Strip, we are talking about individuals and organization. How many? It's not even ISIS. I mean, they decided to call themselves ISIS just in the last couple of weeks. Before that, they were kind of uh, a branch of Ansar Beit el Magdas. But when Ansar Beit el Magdas in Sinai decided to become ISIS, so they became ISIS also. But we're not talking about hundreds of people, maybe 100, maybe 200, not more than that, maybe le even less than that. You know, according to Hamas, it's a couple of tens of people, that's it. With but 17 not, in jail. Yeah, <laughs> even more. And now they're not organized. They're not really working under one flag, one leadership. A couple of people, a few people that are leading the, the let's say, jihadi salafist uh, trend inside gaza so they're more of a nuisance to hamas than a, a real threat to their regime it's a headache it's a big headache because they know that they have the ability what to do to strike israel meaning when they have a quarrel when when, when they go on a fight with hamas the immediate thing that they do is to push the bottom and to launch a rocket towards israel of course so every time that we see this argument between two palestinians in gaza israel is the one that is paying the price but the recent threats that they made didn't realize they didn't fire is Hamas effective in, in stopping their fire Hamas is trying to be very effective now we know that there's not 100% uh, results but there is 100% effort and this is what we see today Hamas is becoming more Palestinian Authority than what the Palestinian Authority used to be in Gaza Strip and it's quite amazing to see that the way that Hamas is trying to keep things quiet kind of the Israeli the Palestinian border police from the Palestinian side trying to keep Israel's security what is the linkage and cooperation between ISIS affiliates in Gaza and Ansar Beit el Magdas in the Sinai? Well, there's no uh, real connection between ISIS abroad, Syria and Iraq, and Ansar Beit el Magdas, just an idea ideologic uh, uh, umbrella. I would say that probably, you know, people are talking on the phone, people probably are sending some messages and, uh, and emails, but it's not that they get their orders from Syria or from Iraq. It's not that uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is calling one man in Sinai and tells him to do this or to do that. Uh, this is a kind of, then again, ideological trend, and they follow this trend. And what we have seen this last week is a dramatic turn by the Egyptian, who until last week considered Hamas to be a bitter enemy and suddenly are cooperating with them. What made this turn? I don't know if they're cooperating with them. I still hear very concerned voices from Egypt concerning the, Israelis, the Israeli policy towards Hamas, Turkey and Qatar. I mean, I don't know if we noticed that, but Israel is negotiating with Hamas through a Qatari diplomat, Muhammad al amadi and through Turkish delegations that are visiting Gaza Strip from time to time. Now, the Egyptians, yes, they change a bit their policy. I don't know if it's a 180% change, but something is going on. They don't consider them a terror organization something anymore. Something is changing through the court, and there is a planned meeting between Khaled Mashal and the Egyptian leadership. He might visit Cairo, and if he will get to Egypt, that's a big change. So Qatar has been trying to mediate between the Egyptians and Hamas? Qatar is trying to mediate between everyone, including Israel and Hamas. So, of course, with the, with the Egyptians, it's even easier. I think that they don't, the Egyptians do not really need Qatar. For them, Qatar is a threat. They don't like the Qataris, they hate the Qataris. And for them, it's an enemy, just like the, the other Muslim Brotherhood the groups, Hamas, Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, etc. If they want to talk to Hamas, they have the ways to do it. But can you envision the Egyptians and Hamas working together against ISIS presence, both in Gaza and in the Sinai? Not really, not really. I mean, it's still on the long run. I think it's very far from us right now. I think that the Egyptians are cutting off any kind of hopes that they have from Hamas or that they had from Hamas. They know that this is radical Islamists, this is radical Islamists. They understand that they might need to be a little bit nicer to Hamas, but not more than that. Many Israelis are concerned that we're going to see another war this summer with Gaza. What's your assessment? 
my gamble and it's a wild gamble that we don't see we won't see another war with gaza strip i think that what we see right now is then again uh, it sounds almost like a cliche and we we said the same thing at the eve of the last war in gaza right now both sides do not share the interest of escalating and we see that especially with Hamas that is working and operating just like a branch of the Israeli Defense Forces. So I want to join your hope and thank you very much for coming to our studio. Thank you, Alan. That's all we have time for. Be sure to visit us again next week for another edition of I-24 News Defense. For all the latest headlines, log on to www.i24news.tv. Have a safe night from Jaffa Port.